All right, what we're going to be breaking down today is the timeline and the origins of aquaculture. Now, we know that aquaculture is related to aquaponics. It's one portion of aquaponics. So it's very important to understand the history and what led up to aquaponics or recirculating aquaculture um, in general. So let's get right into it. Let's jump into the time machine and we're going to go back into time, starting back all the way back to the ancient humans. Now, before we get into that, I want to go into the definition of aquaculture or what aquaculture is, just in case somebody out there might be unfamiliar with what it is. So aquaculture is basically human involvement in raising aquatic animals, aquatic species. So taking, if you're digging up anything artificial, making anything man-made and putting fish in there and raising them, that would be fall under aquaculture. So with that being said, let's jump to what led up to aquaculture and why it is important in today's society. So back into the time machine, we're gonna jump all the way back about 315,000 years ago. That's when the modern day humans, our homo sapiens, first came um, into play. Uh, they originated in Africa, somewhere probably around the Horn of Africa, down there around Ethiopia, around the Sudan, um, Somalia, somewhere around those areas. Probably the oldest bones are found somewhere in Ethiopia, but nonetheless, they originated out of Africa. Um, and these were nomadic people, so they were also hunter-gatherers, meaning that they were just like all the other animals that you see out there in nature, going out there hunting, and having to go and gather uh, and bring the food in and, and, and get food in that means. They didn't have refrigerators, snack shelves, freezers, and all these other things that we have today. They had to get out there and survive. Just like you see, you can go and see this in nature, any other animals, bears, we see them out here, they're out here surviving. Um, uh, foxes, wolves, we did the same exact thing. So, like I said, we were nomadic people at that time, so we would go, that means we weren't sojourning in just one place. We're going in a variety of places. If resources became scarce, we would go out into different areas and relocate where the resources were abundant. So about 164,000 years ago, that's when the Homo sapiens began getting introduced to things like shellfish, cooking and gathering shellfish. You can read about that uh, in an article called What It Means to Be Humans by the National Museum of Natural History. And then important, very important to know, is around 12,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago, that's when we began domesticating animals and the onset of agriculture began at that time. So domesticating animals, for those that don't know, is basically taking an animal from its wild state, its natural state, and converting it into something that's pretty much suitable for human needs, whether it be protection, you know, or companionship, which dogs have been used for, or for food, primarily like sheep, lamb, goats, um, chickens, things of that nature. So around 10,000 years ago, we also began domesticating plants as well. Barley, um, wheat, lentils, things of that nature. We found out that we can take the seeds and then we can uh, place them in areas that we want them to be placed in instead of just relying solely on nature to do it itself. With the domestication of these animals and plants, these nomadic people now begin to settle in areas because food Going out hunting, that was not something that was a primary concern since we've now learned to create pretty much artificial environments that created uh, food in abundance. We can now specialize in skills. We can now create large centers for populations. And then with civilization, they began creating social and economic class or dividing people up into social and economic classes or creating caste systems. So without agriculture, you get no civilization. Without civilization, you get none of the things that the common person enjoys today, such as a lot of the foods, um, a lot of the technology, the television, cell phones, Facebook, YouTube, none of that stuff exists without civilization. And on a deeper level, civilization is the downfall of humanity. This is a great mystery for some of you out there that have an ear and who can hear. Now, with that being said, like I previously mentioned, we had already begun domesticating many plants and animals. But we still had not begun domesticating fish and other seafoods. We were still capturing them from out there in the marine life, bringing them back in and eating them, you know, using that type of method. It wasn't until about 3500 BC, some scholars say around 2000 BC, that's when China revolutionized the way that food and other uh, fisheries were produced. They began creating confined areas 
where they were uh, inputting fish and finding out that they can produce those fish um, on, a, on a consistent basis. This was the onset of aquaculture. China is the cradle of aquaculture according to modern scholars. Now following China, you had ancient Egypt or Kemet, which is what they called their land. Kemet meaning the black land. They raised tilapia there. You can see this written in the hieroglyphics in the tombs. They raised tilapia, which is where you get the name Nile tilapia, which they originate from the Nile River, which is the longest river uh, pretty much in the world, stretching over around 4,000 miles, a little over 4,000 miles. Now, other notable cultures were the Romans and the Native Americans. They also developed their own aquaculture production methods that lasted during the time period of their early civilization, and it served the people well. Now, here in the United States of America in 1909, that's when the first trout farm was introduced in Snake River Canyon. This is the same Snake River Canyon that the madman Evil Knievel tried to jump over in 1974. Unsuccessful attempts, but yet the man still tried, so you got to give him credit for his craziness. Moving on, in the 1960s, that's when you get a bloom of warm water aquaculture, particularly catfish or channel catfish in Arkansas and in Mississippi. A lot of you guys like to slap your lips on um, um, a channel catfish and all types of catfish. This is pretty much where it started in the 1960s around this area, Arkansas and Mississippi. Now up to this point, the entire world is populated now with humans and the population is now beginning to drastically increase. Think about it. Population is increasing. People are living longer due to modern medicine. Also, along with the population increasing, the demand for seafood is also increasing proportionally. Especially here in, in America and in the Western world. People are now becoming more health conscious and seeing the benefits of eating seafood in comparison to eating red meat such as beef, pork, um, lamb, you know, and things of that nature. Now, here's the kicker. In order to meet that demand, the majority of the world's wild-caught fish are now harvested at or near the maximum sustainable levels. This means that we're taking, pretty much taking more fish out than are being replenished by the natural environment. This causes us to resort to aquaculture. You have to understand this when I'm telling you this. This re resorts to man having to intervene and create aquaculture and really, really get involved in aquaculture. Aquaculture now makes up more than half of all the fish and seafood provided that humans consume. So when you go into Walmart and you're going and looking in there and you're going to the frozen food section or the fresh food section and you see all the packaged salmon and um, tilapia, more than half of that is coming from aquaculture. Now this shows you the importance of aquaculture in today's civilization to meet the increasing demand of seafood from all the people. Now, in the 1900s, around 19, I think it's 1902, the human uh, consumption or the U.S. consumption of seafood was around 11.1 or 11.2 pounds of seafood per person. All the way up to 2017, it increased to 16 pounds per person. Now, when you read in Rick Parker's book, um, it's called The uh, Aquaculture Science, he states in there for every pound increase per person, so if one person in, uh, eats one pound more of fish or seafood per year, that equals to about 700 million pounds of food. So the entire population goes from 11 to 12 pounds of uh, food being uh, consumed per year. That requires 700 million pounds more fish to be um, produced. And that's not gonna happen from the wild and um, in, uh, nat in nature. That's just not gonna happen there because we're already at maximum capacity. So it requires man to intervene in today's time. This is the, 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 this is the trade-off. You start to see the trade-off when you start having civilization and putting technology and increasing the population. This is the trade-off. Man has to intervene to sustain itself. All right? So it also predicts in there that in the year 2025, it's gonna, the human consumption is gonna be somewhere around 25 pounds of seafood per person. It begins to increase. So aquaculture is gonna be even more in demand, right? You hear some people that talk about 
why do you grow fish and man-made ponds and all these things like that? That's just because they're unaware of the, the current situation. If they're aware of the circumstance, they would be growing fish too, or they would be participating and be an advocate for growing fish in uh, man-made environments. It's a requirement. If you do not want to grow food in man-made environments, then you'd have to go into pre-civilization. You have to go all the way back to what we talked about, pre-civilization. And when you, in pre-civilization, I was reading, and some scholars will say that the maximum population for humans in a pre-civilization, um, a, a, a pre in pre-civilization is around 10 million. If you want to sustain yourself using only natural resources and, and nothing man-made, you go back to the hunter-gathering phase. It's only around 10 million. Today, we have about 7.7 .7 billion with a B. That's not going to happen. That's unrealistic. This is what we have to understand. In 2050, we're looking at somewhere around 9.9 .9 billion with a B. We're already at maximum sustainability for, the, um, for wild caught fish. 50% is already coming from aquaculture, man-made man -made, um, uh, uh, ponds and man-made um, uh, environments. 2050 is going to be even more aquaculture. We can't do anything with the wild caught no more. We have to remember this. Wild caught is out of the, that's, that's out of the question. Everything is going to aquaculture. In aquaculture, that's where we get our recirculating aquaculture. That's a more advanced technology. Now we're being more sustainable. We can grow fish in more confined areas. We can now reuse the water with recirculating aquaculture. We can condition it using a different type of filtration. We can condition it and reuse it multiple times. You see that? That's the importance of it. Recirculating aquaculture is going to have its own lane. It's having its own lane in the aquaculture production of food. It's in his own lane. We can now reuse the water. When you read Michael Timmons and uh, James Eberling's, I think I'll be tearing your name up. If, if you're watching, I apologize. James uh, Eberling or Eberling, when you read their book, Recirculating Aquaculture, they state in there that recirculating aquaculture uses around 90 to 99% less water than traditional uh, aquaculture. So that's a huge sustainable uh, aspect of recirculating aquaculture. They claim that it's in infinitely expandable and sustainable, you know, and we'll see in the future. But we need the technology, obviously, to sustain ourselves here if humans want to survive or if humans want to continue eating um, seafood at the rate that we are demanding it. So hopefully this gives you a, a quite an understanding of the history, the timeline and what's leading up to current the current state of aquaculture and the importance of aquaculture in today's times. Like I said, we can't depend on just natural environments in order to produce the demands for today uh, because it's just at an alarming rate. The population is extremely high and we have to keep this in mind. We can't be ignorant of this because there's a time where we're going to have to face this. We're going to have to face this and we're doing a, 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 a pretty good job at doing it right now. More people are going to get involved as they see the opportunity to go ahead and um, contribute to the problem of, um, of fish and seafood demand. So there's a lot of potential in this area, a lot of potential in this field, and it's looking pretty optimistic um, for, you know, for the, the, sh the, the future, the short future, I should say. So with that being said, this is the breakdown, the timeline, the origin of aquaculture and why it's important and why it's necessary in today's time. Hopefully you've got some understanding out of this and that you can use this and, um, and keep this in your, your, your bank of knowledge. So with that being said, this is Brooklyn St. Michael with the School of Aquaponics reminding you to stop walking and get you a car.